Recording has started. All right, well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this special event co-hosted by the Research Triangle Regional Partnership, or RTRP, and the North Carolina Technology Association, or NC Tech. I'm Brooks Rayford, I'm president of NC Tech, and we've been longtime partners and collaborators with RTRP over the years, and we're pleased to do so again for today's session on current cybersecurity threats, best practices, and federal resources for small and medium businesses to combat cyber attacks. This is an especially challenging issue for companies and organizations that may not have extensive internal resources. So we're pleased to be able to host Senator Tom Tillis and the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Administration for their insights and guidance. To get us underway, I'd like to introduce my friend and partner, Ryan Combs, Executive Director of RTRP for almost four years now. <clears throat> Ryan has served in state and federal government roles, including on the staffs of two U.S. Senators from North Carolina and at the White House. He's a great champion for the Greater Triangle region, and his team has put this session together today. So, Ryan, thanks for partnering with us on this, and I'll let you take it from here. Brooks, thanks so much for the, the intro, and thank you uh, and the NC Tech for partnering with us today. Um, as Brooks said, I'm Ryan Cones. I'm the Executive Director of the Research Triangle Regional Partnership. We are a 12-county regional economic development organization. And our primary mission is to go out and market uh, the strengths of the Triangle Region to the rest of the world. And Brooks and his team, as he said, they've been a great partner of ours for four years now. Um, and so everyone that's on today that is a part of the North Carolina Tech Association, we really appreciate uh, your sponsorship of NC Tech. You're not only helping Brooks, but you're helping all of us in economic development do our job. So thank you. Also want to thank Senator Tillis for agreeing to help us facilitate this call today. Uh, Senator Tillis is a great friend to our organization and even with his incredible workload in the Senate, uh, he never sa uh, says no when we ask him to do something for us. He and his staff are always super responsive to any requests we have, whether it's assisting in webinars like the one today, to picking up the phone and calling potential companies and to hosting groups in Washington. Just recently we had a French company here in February before COVID started and I was meeting with them and they told me they were going to Washington the next day and the Senator rearranged his schedule to meet with them and we we're successful in recruiting them to North Carolina. So he's always uh, helpful in any situation we need. So thank you, Senator Tillis. Uh, and thank you for your dedication and your commitment to our great state and everything you do for us in Washington. Obviously today's call is all about cybersecurity. Obviously this is a popular topic. It's a major threat to not only our business, but our national security. And the COVID pandemic has only opened the door to additional cyber threats. I was recently reading an article on Forbes that said Google is currently seeing over 240 million coronavirus spam emails per day and phishing attacks are up 667 percent since February. Clearly we'd all like to know what is being done at the federal level level to combat these threats and that is why we reached out to Senator Tillis. As most of you may know before serving in the U.S. Senate, Senator Tillis had a 22-year career in technology management consulting at both Price Waterhouse Coopers and IBM. That background provided Senator Tillis with a deep understanding of policy making and analyzing complex issues and prepared him for his current role in Washington where he serves as chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee's Subcommittee on Intellectual Property. As chairman, the senator is dedicated to ensuring the federal government is doing all they can to protect American businesses and preventing the theft of American intellectual property. And with that, I'd love to turn it over to Senator Tom Tillis. Well, thank you, Ryan, for the kind introduction. It's great to be here speaking with you today, although uh, virtually. Um, I think you know me well enough, Ryan, to know that I'm not really big on uh, prepared speeches or long speeches, but this is one example or one instance where I'm going to uh, make an exception because there's so many important things to talk about. So I wanna thank you, I wanna thank Brooks, the Research Triangle, uh, regional partnership and NC Tech Association for holding this event. It's critically important. There's a lot of valuable information that will be discussed. I also want to thank CISA, the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency, for providing subject matter experts to discuss cyber threats in North Carolina companies face today and the threats that we have in the whole of federal government. 
we want to work with you, partner with you, and help secure your businesses. It's essential for the, it's essential the federal government do more to raise awareness to engage directly with innovation companies like so many we have in North Carolina. There have been multiple public warnings issued about cyber threats in the last few months, and I've received classified briefings on many of these threats. However, my first thought after the briefing was Congress and federal agencies responsible for helping American companies need to do more to make sure you have the information you need. I think the single most important thing we can do to help American companies are briefings like these. CISA is a sub-agency of the Department of Homeland Security. Their job is to defend American infrastructure by working with private companies to help you build more secure and resilient infrastructure based on their knowledge and their real-time understanding of current threats. They're the people who can help you before you are the target of a cyber attack, not after. And while Americans are working tirelessly to help each other, criminal enterprises and foreign adversaries see this as an opportunity and they're exploiting every opportunity they can. In May, the FBI and CISA issued a joint notice warning that hackers affiliated with the Chinese government were targeting American companies. Specifically, Chinese hackers were targeting COVID-19 related research. China is sending a clear message. If Americans can invent it, they will steal it. The threat from China is not something new, but during the pandemic, their attempts to steal intellectual property are a clear threat to our national security. That's why in May, I sent a bipartisan letter with Senators Blumenthal, Cornyn, and Sass to the FBI and CISA asking if they needed additional funding or statutory authorities to better defend American companies like yours. America's recovery depends on innovative companies working to develop vaccines and treatments. And it's incredibly important that we protect your hard earned intellectual property. I also sent a bipartisan letter with Senator Blumenthal to Senators McConnell and Schumer, encouraging them to include additional funding for CISA specifically to help harden our innovation infrastructure in the United States. We've got to do more to protect intellectual property, especially anything related to COVID-19. Federal hackers are not only targeting COVID-19 related intellectual property. Hackers affiliated with governments of foreign adversaries are seeking to take advantage of weaknesses created by remote work. Criminal enterprises are also constantly on the hunt for vulnerabilities and ways to steal valuable intellectual property or hold our systems hostage until you pay a huge ransom to recover them. In July, I sent a letter to the FBI and CISA about a threat from Russian hackers affiliated with the Russian military who are launching sophisticated ransomware attacks against American companies. In the letter, I urge FBI and CISA to do more to outreach, more for outreach like this, to raise awareness and of all these threats and future threats. I'm working to raise awareness through letters of federal agencies and congressional hearings. In fact, this won't be announced publicly until later today, but I want you to hear it first. In September, I'm going to hold a Senate Judiciary Intellectual Property Subcommittee hearing on the cyber threats to American intellectual property. I cannot urge you strongly enough to take these warnings seriously and to be proactive. The threat of cyber attacks is not limited to companies doing COVID-19 research. Every American company is a potential target. And before I turn this briefing over to the experts, I think it's also important to know where you need to go if your company's been a victim of a cyber attack. The FBI recommends that you contact the closest FBI field office. For businesses in Raleigh, the closest FBI offices would be Charlotte or Norfolk. You can also contact the local U.S. Attorney's Office. I appreciate RT, RTRP and NC Tech Association for inviting me to speak with you today. And I'll do everything I can to help harden these company or harden our industry. This is something I did for a living as a partner at Price Waterhouse and a partner at IBM Global Business Services. We need to take heed of all the advice from federal agencies, and we need to work with private enterprise to harden our infrastructure and save our intellectual property. Thank you all for hosting this event today. And again, thanks to the CISA experts for joining the call. You'll learn a lot from them. And I would also say on a final note, because so much of what we're talking about are the big issues, do what I did when I first came to the Senate. I bought the book called Hacking for Dummies. The reason I bought that book 
is I knew most of the things that they do to actually get in. The human factor is a critical vulnerability. It's important to read some of the tools that are available on the internet and they're being exploited by sophisticated infrastructures. We have to take this threat as the serious threat that it is and events like this take a step in that direction. Ryan Brooks, thanks again for doing this. I appreciate your work on the issue and I'll do everything I can to support you. Thank you, Senator Tillis. Uh, well, without further ado, uh, Sean, why don't I kick it over to you to, to, to lead off the briefing? Thank you so much. Um, we've got some slides for you today. Uh, my name is Sean McCluskey. I'm with the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. I'm with uh, what's called the Cybersecurity Advisor Program. My colleague, Neil Gaudreau, is with our Stakeholder Engagement Division. Um, and we've got kind of a, a lot of information to throw at you today, um, a lot of it. Uh, but rest assured, I'm, I want to make sure that you all have the, the copies of these slides. You all have my contact information. Uh, what we're going to cover today is briefly going to cover kind of who we are as an agency, what we do. We'll move into a brief conversation on cyber threats. The senator did a fantastic job of uh, kind of outlining that problem set. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the Cybersecurity Advisor Program, and then I'll turn it over to Neil Gaudreau, and Neil will kind of talk about some of the things that you can do right now to help uh, improve your cybersecurity posture. Uh, once we're done with that, I'll, I'll, Neil will kick it back to me, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the services, the cybersecurity services that CISA um, offers that you can take advantage of. And then at the end, we'll, we'll have some time for Q&A. So first off, I wanted to thank uh, Senator Tillis. I wanted to thank the RTRP and NC Tech for having us today. We're honored to be here. And uh, without further ado, we can, we can go ahead and jump in. Uh, Ashley, could you hit the next slide, please? So who we are, uh, the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency. Uh, prior to becoming our own agency, we were a headquarters element of, of big DHS. Um, on the right-hand side there, you can kind of see some of our mission pillars. Uh, federal network protection is one of our big uh, responsibilities, so the .gov network. Uh, proactive cyber protection for critical infrastructure is a big piece of what we do, and we'll talk a lot about that today. Uh, infrastructure resilience and field operations. Uh, CISA is moving to a, uh, what we call regional field concept, similar to what the FBI does where we have our resources closer to our partners in the field. And then our last pillar there is the emergency communications piece where we work with uh, state and local uh, and, and public partners uh, to improve emergency communications. So uh, next slide, please. Like I said, I'm gonna move a little fast through these parts, um, but you will have the slides. So I'm not gonna read that to you, um, but that's our vision and our mission. Overall goal really is to strengthen the overall critical infrastructure security posture of the nation. That's both from a physical standpoint and from a cybersecurity standpoint. And we do that in collaboration with our private sector partners, our public sector partners, and, and also other federal agencies uh, to accomplish that mission because it's just too large a problem to try to tackle for one specific agency. We need a whole team approach. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so that being said, we'll move into the, the cyber threat piece. Um, Ashley, could you hit the next one? And as I said, the senator did a good, great job of, of kind of outlining this problem. So um, Internet of Things devices are increasingly being added in sensitive places uh, that have high consequence, such as hospitals. Uh, many of those devices can be easily hacked and gathered into large botnets, uh, creating armies of computers that adversaries can use to debilitate target institutions. Malicious actors can easily use publicly available search engines to discover Vulnerable devices directly connected to the internet, in many cases, provide backdoor access to sensitive networks. So what we're talking about there are websites like Shodan that enumerate the internet and, and you know, post IP addresses of internet-facing sensitive type uh, devices such as SCADA systems or, uh, or, or other type internet-facing type um, devices. Illicit markets for stolen personal data continue to grow on the dark web. Markets not only exist for financial data, such as credit card information, but for compromised business credentials that can allow malicious actors entry into protected networks. So things, think of somebody actually breaking into your network but not actually doing anything, taking those credentials and selling them. Uh, that's, that's a key threat. Uh, hacking as a service connects clients with malicious actors willing to conduct illegal cyber attacks for a fee. So basically cyber hired, hired guns. Additionally, the latest iterations of malicious tools are available for purchase and have become increasingly user-friendly over the years, lowering the barrier for entry for malicious act actors. Okay, next slide, please. 
Okay, this, this slide kind of describes kind of the consequences on the left-hand side and then the actors with their capabilities on the bottom um, there. So when we're talking about um, cyber actors and cyber threats, uh, at present, China and Russia pose the greatest espionage and cyber threats. We anticipate that all of our adversaries and strategic competitors will increasingly build and integrate cyber espionage, attack, and influence capabilities into their efforts to influence U.S. policies and advance their own national security interests. We anticipate that financially motivated cyber criminals very likely will expand their targets in the U.S. in the next few years. Their actions increasingly disrupt U.S. critical infrastructure in healthcare, finance, government, emergency services sectors based on the pattern of activities over the past that we've observed over the past few years. This is particularly true as it relates to ransomware attacks. Um, and I can't stress that enough. Uh, ransomware, and we'll talk a little bit about that um, when Neil talks about cyber essentials, but ransomware has, is absolutely uh, a debilitating problem right now, uh, and we really have to work together to kind of prevent that. And there are some things Neil will talk about in, in the cyber essentials that will help with that. Uh, terrorists could obtain a disclosed compromising or personally identifiable information through cyber operations, and they may use such disclosures to coerce, extort, or inspire and enable physical attacks against their victims. The growing availability and use of publicly and commercially available cyber tools is increasing the overall volume of unattributed cyber activity around the world. The use of these tools increases misattributions and misdirected responses by both governments and the private sector. All right, next slide, please. All right, so uh, APT, Advanced Persistent Threat. Um, and you see the kind of the major players there that we, we, we talk about when we talk about advanced pers persistent threat. Russia poses a cyber espionage influence and attack threat to the United States and our allies. Moscow continues to be a highly capable and effective adversary, integrating cyber espionage, attack, and influence operations to achieve its political and military objectives. Moscow is now staging cyber attack assets to allow it to disrupt or damage U.S. civilian and military infrastructure during a crisis and poses a significant cyber influence threat. China. China represents, uh, presents a persistent cyber espionage threat and a growing attack threat to our core military and critical infrastructure systems. China remains the most active strategic competitor responsible for cyber espionage against the U.S. government, corporations, and its allies. It is improving its cyber attack capabilities and altering information online, shaping Chinese views and potentially the views of U.S. citizens. Iran. Iran continues to present a cyber espionage and attack threat. Iran uses increasingly sophisticated cyber attacks to conduct espionage. It is also attempting to deploy cyber attack capabilities that would enable attacks against critical infrastructure in the United States and allied countries. Iran uses social media platforms to target U.S. and allied audiences. North Korea. North Korea poses a cyber espionage threat and retains the ability to conduct disruptive cyber attacks. North Korea continues to use cyber capabilities to steal from financial institutions to generate revenue. Pyongyang's cybercrime operations include attempts to steal more than 1.1 billion from financial institutions across the world, including a successful cyber heist of an estimated 81 million from the New York Federal Reserve account of Bangladesh's central bank. Okay, um, Ashley, next slide, please. Um, next slide. You can hit the next one, there you go. Okay, so, um, so all that is scary stuff, all that is bad stuff, um, and we wanted to kind of start that as a, as, as a baseline for this conversation because, yes, it's bad, but there's, we're going to tell you now things that you can do about it and things that you can do to protect yourself and your organization. So um, I mentioned our, our mission earlier as CISA, um, us as the Cybersecurity Advisor Program. What we're trying to do here is we're trying to uh, put subject matter experts closest to our partners. Uh, personally, I'm here based in Charlotte. Uh, we are currently hiring for a new cybersecurity advisor in the Raleigh area, so there'll be two of us in North Carolina. Um, but for now, you can you can lean on me and, and contact me if you need anything from us. Um, and what we do as cybersecurity advisors is really our goal, as I mentioned up front, is to increase the nation's cybersecurity posture, which is a huge job. But uh, we, we do that through several different ways. We do it through assessments. So we, we you know, evaluate through some of the, the risk assessments that we provide. And I'll talk about that in, in the second half of this. Um, we promote best practices. So things like the NIST cybersecurity framework, the cyber essentials that Neil is gonna talk about. Um, and we build, we, we, we talk about, and the Senator mentioned this as well, that we like to come in before there's an incident and really help build capacity. 
Um, and we do that by supporting communities of interest like the, the um, NC Tech and the RTRP. Uh, this is a community of interest that's kind of right up our alley to support, and we're, we're so glad that we were invited here to talk about it. We do it through education, so basically raising awareness by doing these types of presentations. Uh, we listen. We like to listen to our partners, find out what their challenges are, what kinds of unique threats they're facing in their environments. And then lastly, um, coordinate. We do an incident coordination role as well where we can help um, support somebody that's had an incident and then develop lessons learned for the uh, rest of the the nation uh, based on those incidents. All right, so next slide, please. I mentioned the cybersecurity advisors right now. There's about 24 of us. We work with all 16 critical infrastructure sectors, uh, elections being a huge part of that under, um, under, under government facilities. Uh, we worked with uh, the smallest of the small, so you know, a, a small rural water municipality with one IT person all the way up to Fortune 500 banks uh, and kind of everybody in between. So we've seen a lot of different um, security postures, a lot of different security problems. Um, so, you know, we've seen, seen quite a bit and, and we, we, we leverage that in our service offerings, in developing new service offerings and modifying our existing ones. So next slide, please. Okay, there's a lay down of kind of our, of our map. There's 24 of us, if you include me. Uh, right now we are in the process of hiring an additional 43 CSAs nationwide, so that's a great thing. Um, I've been spending my last two months basically with our regional staff, our uh, regional director, Don Robinson, um, and Sean Stallworth, one of our chief protective security advisors, just interviewing folks for, for Region 4. So uh, we're looking forward to getting new folks on board and really kind of helping get the word out about some of our services. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so I talked really fast. I said a lot of things. Um, at this point, I will uh, turn it over to Neil Gaudreau, with our stakeholder uh, engagement division. And Neil's gonna kind of cover one of our, our newer products or cybersecurity essentials. And these are things that you can do right now uh, to help improve your posture. So with that, I will turn it over to Neil. Okay, great, Sean, can you hear me? I can, Neil. Okay, great. That's, uh, can we move to the next slide, please? A little background about Neil. Neil uh, did 20 years in the Marine Corps and um, retired from the Marine Corps in 2001. Uh, I currently work for CISA. I've been here for about six years, but prior to that, I was uh, engaged in the industry, uh, working with small, medium, large businesses, uh, bringing consulting services to uh, help them with their cyber security related challenges. Um, I currently work in DC, but uh, due to the current situation, I'm down here in Pensacola working remotely. Um, Looking at Cyber Essentials, we, uh, we had really nothing, not a whole lot of information uh, or products that would support medium, small, medium businesses. So last year, we moved out and um, developed a product called Cyber Essentials. Uh, you can find that uh, at cisa.gov forward slash Cyber Essentials. The, the basic principles of establishing a cybersecurity program as well as the awareness that's needed to support a cybersecurity program. I do not have a video, a audio, a video, so bear with me. Um, next slide, please. It should say CISA highlights. Uh, CISA has a few things going on right now, and we've been very, very busy since January with COVID, the uh, Microsoft vulnerability, and the Iranian tensions, but we have some really good things coming up here. Uh, we have the National Cybersecurity Summit, uh, which is scheduled for mid-September. Some of the key uh, topics that we'll be uh, addressing are key cyber insights, leading the digital transformation, diversity in cybersecurity, and defending democracy. Another, um, we, we have a site, uh, it's on uscert.cisa.gov, where uh, organizations can go and see all the good work that our analysts are, are, are doing in support of getting the word out on current vulnerabilities and security issues. Uh, highly recommend that you take a look at those sites. Um, we have a, um, and Sean's going to talk about this in a few minutes here. Uh, we have a, this is a service catalog of all the various services that we perform in support of our mission 
uh, to protect and defend the U.S. Um, next slide, please. You should be looking at a uh, very colorful uh, slide with uh, multiple areas within it. Um, uh, yourself, yourself, you know, this, this presentation here is geared towards a small and medium business. Keep that in mind. I know we have a, uh, a very broad audience here, consistent of small, medium businesses, as well as large enterprises. Um, yourself, yourself being the CEO, being the owner of the business, um, your staff are those people that are supporting your mission to sell products, to deliver services, um, your systems. Your systems are what are core to the back end, back office, day-to-day uh, -day functions within your organization. Your surroundings are those things where you work, who you do business with, uh, do you have uh, offshore HRIS systems, order entering systems? Uh, do you have relationships with other vendors there? Uh, the most important I see on this slide deck right here is your data. Uh, you really need to know your data, who's accessing your data, and, and what security you have applied to that data. Because as you heard earlier, Sean brought up some pretty persistent bad actors out there. And uh, one of those, China, uh, is, is very uh, excited and uh, has a, a pretty extensive uh, cyber workforce that's trying to get to your data, your trade secrets, uh, your inventions, uh, who you're doing business with. Um, so you need to really know the bad actor. You need to know your people, your staff, your data, and your relationships um, because we have that persistent actor. But more importantly, you need to know and be able to respond in stress. We see it on the news every single day. Uh, so many companies getting compromised. Some of the compromises are uh, initiated from internal users clicking on links, uh, receiving emails, clicking on attachments, and then the next thing you know, you're held hostage to ransomware, and they're asking for money to, to unlock your data. Data is critical. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide here should show you all the various functions within an organization. You know, typically in a small, medium business, the owner of the company is performing a lot of these functions, and they're not as structured as you see in large uh, organizations. So that owner may be the board of director, maybe the council, maybe uh, responsible for the security, managing programs within the organization, and hiring. And, and, and working uh, the HR functions as well as outward communication. And again, managing the books, the finance. So um, it, there's a lot to it. Uh, the importance is, is that you stress cybersecurity throughout all these major functions within, within any businesses. The large organizations, you'll see that they have dedicated IT teams. You'll see that they have dedicated cybersecurity personnel. But in the small, medium businesses, that's a challenge. And typically, that's a dual-headed function that maybe uh, you know, someone that's doing accounting is, is providing those services. Next slide, please. So we break it down and we show those major functions. Next slide. Uh, moving to the leader slide. Uh, what is the role of the leader? Really need to promote cybersecurity as a culture within the organization. Um, you need to understand the risk in business terms um, should you be compromised and what it would actually do to your organization. Uh, once you do that, then you can establish policy and procedures for uh, the company to adhere to. And most importantly, you need to uh, you know, practice what's preached. So some of the things you might want to ask yourself is, do I have uh, a plan to mitigate risk. Uh, we all know that Microsoft releases new patches, updates, security fixes every Tuesday. So um, you might want to ask yourself, am I applying these patches? I mean, in a lot of cases, uh, people are working remotely today. They may be using personal computers. They may be using business assets. Uh, when that box pops up and says update, you need to update. You need to make sure your people are updating and not ignore it because you have an immediate task at hand. Updating your systems is critical and reduces the vulnerabilities. 
And our vendors, Microsoft, the Linuxes, they do a real good job of pushing patches out there. Uh, next bullet uh, that you might want to ask yourself is, do I have a process for responding to an incident? Okay, a user in your environment clicked on a link and all of a sudden that PC is frozen and it's asking for a payment of X amount of Bitcoin. Uh, how are you going to respond to that? Do you have the people in-house to respond to that? You should have that process documented and it should be known throughout the organization so that when that does happen, you can respond appropriately. Uh, do your managers uh, and team leads understand what their roles are related to cybersecurity? Next slide, please. So we put together on this slide a few tips for leaders in small and medium businesses that they can move forward with and, and move the needle and move the maturity of the organization to the right a little so that you're better protected and you can defend and respond to an incident. Um, policy is critical. There's a ton of policy out there. CISA.gov has everything imaginable out there. You have another organization called NIST.gov, National Institute of Standards and Technology. They publish hundreds of uh, best practices, hardening guides. Uh, so if you do have a an IT shop, you should ask them to leverage what's already been done. You don't have to develop it in-house. It's been done by by, uh, by the federal government and they're really good documents. Those are the baseline security requirements and hardening guides. Uh, if, if you have a board and you have other interest in your company, you need to engage them. Let them know what you're doing. Know them. Let them know what your shortfalls are and what it's going to take to close those gaps. Uh, you need to know your network. You need to know what data you have. You need to know how dependent the organization is on, on IT. And you need to know, more importantly, what would happen if something you had an incident and you no longer had access to those resources. Uh, you know, a payroll system. You're leveraging uh, a company that's providing that service to you. Uh, the service goes down, but you can no longer pay you your personnel. So that's a major impact. It's a business risk. And uh, of course, it's going to make the employees not happy. When you do have those type of arrangements with uh, offshore uh, service providers, you need to ask them the security questions as well. What are you doing for security? What are you doing to protect my personal information, my employees' personal information? Um, and, and start the conversations there. Uh, you need to um, commit to a, tra a formal training uh, plan, you know, uh, awareness, uh, informing the folks within your organization of the best practices, the do's and do nots, so that uh, it filters across the organization. Typically, people will do if they know. So, you know, creating that awareness program is a, is a great step. We all know that uh, our weakest link is our end users, and if they don't know, they're going to do uh, things that they shouldn't, and they are going to put your business at risk. Next slide. Legal counsel. Slide. Um, all organizations should have, if they don't have it in-house, should have legal counsel that, you know, you can make the phone call when you're negotiating contracts with um, external service providers, uh, asking those tough security questions, uh, having someone that you can pick up the phone and and, and, and make the call and, and seek guidance on anything related to cyber. Uh, a lot of organizations are opting for uh, cyber insurance. Uh, your legal counsel should be able to help you to see if that's something that might fit your organization. Next slide, please. Uh, SIPs for legal counsel. Um, Policy, it's all driven by policy. If your or organization is regulated, there's specific um, information assurance requirements that you need to adhere to. Next slide, please. And be ready for a cybersecurity breach. It's not a matter of if, it's when. Okay. Human resources has a, a, a big responsibility. Uh, I'm hoping that we're on the human resources slide. And um, primarily awareness is, is, is happening in uh, human resources organizations that don't have IT or cybersecurity shops. So leverage your HR team to 
uh, develop best practices, uh, end user agreements, things to that nature so that your users comply to your standards. Next slide, please. And there's some great tips there for the human resources uh, function or within your organization. Finance, okay. Uh, we all know that cybersecurity is not cheap and for small, medium businesses, it, it poses a challenge. But uh, once you build your uh, awareness and the culture of cybersecurity, you need to have the resources to support that, typically in finance and people. So uh, when addressing uh, budgets, cybersecurity should be a concern. Uh, you know, choosing the right hardware, choosing the right software, having the people to harden that software so that it's ready to go production use. Uh, you know, having a qualified return on investment is always a challenge within cybersecurity because um, you know it, it's usually when a breach occurs that you can modify, uh, you can actually assess the actual losses. But uh, ROI drives investments, uh, security drives investments, and depending upon what sector you're in, uh, that's going to drive investments as well. And what best drives in, uh, investments in, in finance is really understanding the risk to the organization based on the actual cyber threat. So um, we're going to move over to the next slide, and I think that's the final bullet cyber essentials update. Uh, again, this is a product that is available on CISA.gov forward slash cyber essentials. Um, it's a living, breathing document as we meet with more and more small and medium businesses, we are generating additional chapters. Currently, we have three chapters, uh, and we expect to have more as we move forward. Um, you know, chapter one was yourself, the leader, pretty much what we talked about today. Uh, Cyber Essentials Toolkit, chapter two, is talking more about your staff and the users on what they can do to better uh, protect the environment. Uh, some of the things we have coming up is uh, your systems. We're going to give you best practices on uh, your systems, your surroundings, your data, and your actions under stress. Uh, with that, uh, that concludes the Cyber Essentials uh, brief for today. I hope you see value in it, and I hope you value um, the information that's on CISA.gov and that you visit it and, and, and leverage it. Uh, you know, the activities that I mentioned earlier that are coming up, I hope you uh, can join. The important thing is, is what you're doing here today. The more that you can socialize with others that may be doing something a little better than you, and you can take that back and share that with your organization, you can be uh, in a better place than, than not. The information sharing is critical within cybersecurity. Uh, that closes my brief. Back to you, Sean. All right, perfect. Thanks, Neil. And just to kind of foot stomp what Neil was saying about uh, when you download those kits, there's, they show a lot more detailed information uh, specifically about um, your systems that you can do right now to help, um, in, including, you know, keeping offline backups and things like that to help prevent ransomware attacks or recover from ransomware attacks. Because that's one of the things we're consistently seeing is, is folks getting hit with ransomware um, and their only live backups are, are encrypted as well because they're online and, and the network is not segmented. So those types of things are included in those detailed toolkits. Um, please go ahead and check those out. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and talk about some of the other cybersecurity services uh, that we offer. Uh, so if you could hit the next slide. Ashley, thank you. Okay, so we talked about this once before. Um, you know, we wanna get involved with our partners pre-incident. Um, so we want to do what we call preparedness activities or build capacity. So those things you see on the left of the slide there are some of the things that we do uh, as an agency and as cybersecurity advisors um, to help you, uh, one, get, get access to our services, but two, uh, increase your security posture through building your programs. Uh, and we do that in a couple different ways. We got, in, you know, information sharing is a big piece of what we do. CISA publishes alerts uh, on a weekly basis, uh, and you can also sign up for those at CISA.gov. Uh, we have some training and awareness uh, resources that I'll talk a little bit about. Uh, we have a national cyber exercises program where we, we work with a lot of uh, state and local partners on, on things like um, CyberStorm or statewide cybersecurity uh, exercises. We have the national cybersecurity awareness system, vulnerability notes, 
uh, and tons of information products and, and recommended best practices like things like cyber essentials, our cyber resilience resource guides, all those types of things that you can find out about by uh, just taking a look at CISA.gov and kind of searching through some of our, our products up there. Uh, I'm not going to belabor uh, evaluations on this particular slide because I have another slide that talks about some of the assessments that are available to you. And I'll talk about those in a little bit more detail. Um, response assistance. Uh, this is this is one of the challenges for the agency as a whole, um, just because of the scale. Uh, our our agency is forced to kind of look at a cybersecurity incident and evaluate it based on the, the impact of national security. So uh, it, it, response assistance is is one of, one of the, the the harder things that we do. But um, some of those resources there, are, you know, remote assistance. Uh, we have a malware analysis lab, and we have a hunt incident response teams that go out uh, depending on the incident. Uh, and work with our partners to recover. Um, I mentioned cybersecurity advisors. I'm going to talk about some of the assessments that we perform and that we can partner with you on. Uh, again, best practices and incident assistance. Then one of the things I didn't mention um, is our protective security advisors. And these are folks also, um, many of you may know Daryl Aspie, who is our protective security advisor here in North Carolina. Um, and they focus on the physical security side. So they can come out to your facility and what's called and do what's called an infrastructure survey where they actually look at your your perimeter and your and and some of your other security apparatus uh, and kind of make some recommendations based on on that uh, evaluation um, so we'll move on to the next slide here I want to do want to make sure we leave some room at the end for for Q and a uh, I mentioned assessments so the first three assessments that you see there the cyber resilience review at the top external dependencies management and cyber infrastructure survey um, and actually, the cybersecurity evaluations tool, uh, all those are performed by our, our cybersecurity advisors. So we can come out to your facility and, and work through these assessments with you. Um, and then the remaining ones are done by our vulnerability management team in Arlington, and they schedule those and, and, and come out as a team. Uh, so real quickly, I'll just go through each one of these and what they do. Um, the CRR is a, is a uh, evaluation of how an organization manages cybersecurity. So it looks at your programs. It looks at things like asset management, incident management plans, configuration management, uh, how you handle um, third-party vendors, uh, all those types of things. There's 10 different domain areas that we cover in that ev evaluation. And there's real simple, uh, there's a maturity aspect to that too, where we can show you how um, mature your, your organization is compared to others that have taken this evaluation. The next one is external dependencies management. Uh, this assessment came out of the cyber resilience review and it solely focuses on um, management of third party risk. I'm sorry, did I have a question? No, okay. okay. Um, the next one is the uh, cyber infrastructure survey. Uh, this one's a little bit lighter weight, easier to digest and really focuses on um, a lot of the security controls that you already have in place. So if, it's a, if you're a smaller organization, uh, this one may scale a little bit better because um, the Cyber Resilience Review has that 10,000 foot view and focuses on, you know, risk assessment, risk management. Um, the Cybersecurity Evaluations Tool. This is uh, a tool that's been around uh, CISA for quite some time, uh, and it really was born out of industrial control systems, but it's been adopted to uh, to match a, a whole bunch of different standards, whether that's NERC, FERC, or whether it's uh, financial standards, or if you want to do an 853 assessment, it's cap that's capable of doing that as well. And one thing I didn't mention is that the CRR and the um, and the CSET are both available freely for download. So if you want to download those, you can check those out. Um, they are on uh, CISA.gov as well. Okay, the next four assessments are are really uh, done by our vulnerability assessment uh, team back in 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 Arlington. Uh, and some of them are, are don't, you know, are, are limited, um, particularly the risk and vulnerability assessment at the bottom there, because uh, it takes a team of folks, um, and a lot of those, you know, they have a federal responsibility as well as uh, critical infrastructure responsibility, and, and a lot of that, um, you know, they only have so many they do per year, so they're difficult to get. So I want to, you know, be upfront and lending of that when we talk about the, the RVA. Um, but the phishing campaign assessment is is something that uh, we can get folks signed up for. It's it, it may take a while to get get you in, in line for that, but uh, basically our our team back in Arlington sends uh, over a course of about six weeks, we'll send uh, phishing emails to your staff, and then 
really when they click on it, all it does is, is in, increment a, a counter, and then they, you know you get that result back and can kind of see how how your organization did. Great way to test your your training and awareness programs. Uh, this next one we can get people signed up immediately for, and it's it's pretty valuable. It's a, a vulnerability scanning. It used to be called cyber hygiene. You may see some of the legacy documents that have cyber hygiene on it, but really it's vulnerability scanning. And all that is is uh, our team will you provide us a list of IP addresses that are internet facing, your perimeter, what you think is out there, and then we'll scan those weekly and give you a, a report on what ports are open and what vulnerabilities are uh, scanners detected. Uh, it's just a good way to confirm what you you think you already know. Um, a lot of times, you know, as folks are working on things, th things get opened up by accident, um, patches get rolled back off by accident. Uh, so it's, it's just a good second check to, to help you uh, confirm you know what you think you know about your perimeter. The next one is a validated architecture design review. Uh, again, this these last two are very difficult um, for us to scale just because of the nature of the of the review and the intensity of of the analysis that has to go into it. Um, but we do conduct a validated architecture design review where our technical team will come in and um, take a look at your network architecture. They'll do some traffic pools. Uh, they'll look for things that uh, that may not look right according to your infrastructure and give you a, a vulnerability uh, report out of that assessment. And the last one is uh, more of a pen test, and that's why, as you can imagine, why it's, it's so difficult to, uh, to scale, because uh, everybody wants a pen test. But I will say that the Vader and the, and the RVA are things that can be found on the open market. Um, you know, there's a little bit of a difference um, in the fact that, you know, the, the, our, our technique is, is slightly different, but um, those can be purchased as well from, from third-party vendors. Um, you know, if, if that's something you have to have right away. Um, so that kind of covers our assessments. And I know I'm speaking fast and throwing a lot at you, um, but, you know, well, you'll have my contact information at the end, and I'm happy to, to follow up, have conversations with, with anyone who, who would like to further talk about these things. So the PCII program, the Protected Critical Infrastructure Information Program, those first three assessments I mentioned on there that, that our, our, our CSAs uh, conduct fall under this PCII program. And what that means is that the information that you give us as part of those assessments is uh, we'll take that back, send that through our PCII office, and it, it gets a tracking number, and then it becomes protected information. And what that, what that is is uh, it protects that information from Freedom of Information Act requests. Uh, it can't be used for sunshine laws in, in, at the local level. It can't be used for civ uh, civil litigation, and it can't be used for regulatory purposes. So, um, you know, that's one of the key you know, key things that we rely on to help folks uh, share information with us, um, that it's not going to end up in the press. It's not going to be published. Um, when, when we conduct those three assessments, the Cyber Resilience Review, External Dependencies Management, and Cyber Infrastructure Survey, when we give you those results, they'll come with a we'll have a PCI tracking number with those, um, and we'll send you a, a non-PCI copy, and that, that copy is yours. You can do with it as you please. I have seen some folks put their stuff on the internet. <laughs> I don't know why they did, but they did, um, but we won't. Um, so that's it's just one of some, something I wanted to cover. Um, next slide, please. Training resources. So um, the National Initiative for Cybersecurity Careers and Studies website. This is uh, this is another one that you should probably check out. Um, on that website, there's over 4,000 different training programs that have been evaluated by DHS, uh, along with how to how to uh, how to obtain those trainings. Um, so it's a good way to, to vet some some training offerings. Uh, we have the National Cybersecurity Workforce Framework, the Nice Framework, uh, which really kind of breaks down. Uh, skill sets for cybersecurity professionals. And, you know, if you need an incident responder, uh, the NICE framework will kind of lay out all the key skills and abilities that that person should have uh, to be an incident responder. And, and uh, there's even a, a push button tool. Um, it's an Excel spreadsheet where you select all the different key skills and abilities that you want, and then it'll help generate a position description. Um, so when you go to hire that person, you have kind of a the groundwork of what you need, what skill sets you need as you go to advertise that position. There's all sorts of tools for cybersecurity managers. Um, there's FedVTE, which I will mention, which is the Federal Virtual Training Environment. Um, this is free to state and locals. So if, uh, if you got a .gov email and your state and local partner, um, 
you know, that's an automatic entry into that. It's also free for veterans. So if you have veterans on your staff, um, they can take advantage of what's on FedVTE, sign up for FedVTE and, you know, take some of the courses that are out there. Uh, we have a program called Scholarship for Service, uh, which really, you know, DHS uh, pays for the, their, their scholarship and then they owe two years back to the federal government or the state government or state governments um, as kind of a payback tour. So great resources out there for that. Um, next slide, please. All right, so I mentioned the NICE framework. Uh, you see the seven different categories down there. Um, you know, we use this all the time when we develop, even when we developed our position descriptions for our new cybersecurity advisors, uh, we, we broke down the exact uh, skill sets that they should have. Really, really helpful um, when you're developing those you know, even, even if you're de developing uh, performance evaluations, um, you know, it helps you really uh, nail down the exact tasks that your cybersecurity workforce should be doing, um, and when, particularly a value when you're hiring new folks. Next slide. Okay, there, we were right at 1220, I, I, I believe. So um, there's my personal email uh, for, down there at the bottom. Uh, also, if you have general inquiries, you can hit that cyber advisor box. Uh, we have folks, a team of folks that monitor that. Um, but I just wanna let you know, feel free to reach out to me directly. Um, I am your, your CSA in North Carolina. Um, I'm also the supervisor for all the region four CSAs. So, uh, you know, if, if I can't make it out, we'll get somebody else out and we'll, we'll make sure that we, we take care of you. Um, Ashley, I think that is it for me. I'm happy to take any questions if anybody has any. I know webinars are tough. People don't want to ask questions on webinars, but. Anybody have questions? Yeah, my, my name's Kevin Robinson. Uh, I work with our triad enterprises. Uh, we recently started a uh, registered apprenticeship program uh, for cybersecurity, uh, information security analyst. And uh, this is great information. We'd like to definitely uh, add to, to our program uh, and lead with this information and make sure our apprentices are aware of how to follow along. Is this recording going to be available or the deck that you just presented from? Uh, we'd definitely like to share that information and make it broadly available to them and, and have them involved in these, uh, these types of uh, webinars. Yeah, the deck definitely will be. Um, I'd, I'd have to defer to Ryan and Brooks. Yeah, and we're actually on the. And, go ahead. Sorry. We'll be able to. We, we are recording this, so we'll be able to provide that for you. Outstanding! It's great content. Thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate that. And Kevin, if you run into any, if you have any questions, or uh, once you look at that next website, and if you have any questions or concerns, please feel free to hit me up. I will definitely be in touch. Anybody else have any questions, concerns, comments, <laughs> good or bad? Well, Sean, y'all did a great job today. We really appreciate you taking time to put this together for us. Ryan, absolutely, absolute pleasure. Um, happy to serve North Carolina and, and what's going on down here. And uh, please uh, reach out if anybody needs anything. All right. Approach. Thank you. Yeah, this is Dennis Hunter. I have to say thank you also. I, I, I thought I knew everything about cybersecurity and I found out something new today. CISA definitely impresses me. Thank you, Dennis. Appreciate that. Thanks. And thanks for Neil, too. Uh, appreciate Neil covering us, that uh, Cyber Essential piece. My pleasure. All right. Thank you, Neil. Thank you, Sean. Brooks, thanks for partnering with us, and we hope this was informative for everybody. And um, you've got everybody's email. If you need anything, let us know. Thanks, everybody. You did to say you were going to be sharing the, the, the uh, slides at some point. Is that true? Yes, this is Ashley with RTRP. I'll send out a follow-up email um, with a link to everything and a link to the recording so you can see anything that, that you may have missed throughout the presentation.
All right, thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you much.